So um, I guess at this point, we will um, call up the folks from the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center who are here to talk about the evaluation they're going to be doing. And if, if I could briefly introduce sure. them. Um, as you know, during your last meeting, April 6, I believe, the commission voted unanimously to award the contract for the 2016 CTPC assessment to the University of Maine um, Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center and uh, Phil Trostel and um, Kate Riley Deluta, Deludio? Deludio. Anyway, they're here today. They've provided um, a brief outline of what they're working on currently. And that is, uh, you can find that on handwritten page nine. And their presentation today and their presentation of this outline is the hope is that you'll have a discussion with them based on this outline and what you understand their original proposal was and that you can have sort of a back and forth about what you're interested in. Do you like this outline? Are there things that you wished to be emphasized that aren't or whatever? And uh, I would say this is your primary opportunity to have ongoing input with them before the assessment is actually completed in early September. So, um, introduce uh, Kath, Kate, Riley, DeLutio, and Phil Trostel. Welcome, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Vol. Representative Saucier yeah. and members of the commission. Um, I'm Kate Deludio and um, Phil Trostel, as Locke explained. And um, I just want to thank you first for the opportunity to do this assessment. It's a very timely topic, um, and so it's been very interesting, you know, to to start to dive into. And we're um, honored by the opportunity to give you good information as you're making uh, recommendations to other policymakers. So the handout is in front of you. Um, it's an outline of the report, as Locke explained. I'm not going to read it, but I will kind of discuss briefly each section. Um, it starts with the guide uh, to the economics of free trade agreements. Um, this is the part of the report that's going to give you the necessary background for um, evaluating what the potential impact of the PP TPP is on Maine. It includes um, some history and kind of information about the motivations for international trade, as well as the highlights um, from the economic literature, um, beginning with the earliest theories about uh, why there are opportunities for countries to benefit from trade, all the way through to um, recent research about uh, why certain regions and groups of workers are having more difficulty um, adjusting to changes in trade um, than perhaps we thought was previously thought. And when I say economic literature, I mean that we're going to be presenting to you um, research that's rigorous, that's from credible sources, um, many of which are you know, in peer-reviewed journals. So that's the type of literature that we're going to be looking at um, you know, to present to you. The second section gives you some more detailed context for understanding um, the TPP's potential impact. Um, Maine's economy is always evolving, and the TPP's impact will be different today than it would have been 20 years ago. So this section really looks at where are we today um, in order to understand what the impact might be. It also will put into context NAFTA, um, because that's a very common touchstone for discussing the TPP. Um, so we really wanted to kind of look at, um, as much as possible, um, how NAFTA did and did not affect Maine's economy, at least what we know of it. See, the third section is um, just about the TPP. Um, it's a massive agreement, as I'm sure you know. So this section will um, explain the major components of it. Um, and again, kind of do a little bit of a comparison with NAFTA. And then section four is um, kind of the meat of the report, probably what people will be most interested in, and that's the TPP's estimated impact on Maine. Um, we'll look at producers and consumers and different sectors. Um, 
because the, we have to limit the scope of the assessment, we're going to look at the industries and sectors, which um, history and theory tell us will probably be the most, the greatest impacted here in Maine. Um, and then we'll also a, evaluate um, some of the available estimates on the TPP's impact on the national economy and from them derive estimates of what the impact would be on Maine. Um, and then finally, the um, FAQ section, um, based on all the information that we've presented in those other four parts of the report, um, we'd like to answer some of the most commonly asked questions and the commonly posed concerns about trade um, and try to uh, provide some kind of straightforward, digestible answers to those um, in that section. And that's um, where we would specifically welcome input on your suggestions for what are those common questions and concerns that you hear the most that you'd really love to have like a good response to. Not the the 50 page report, but kind of what are the the highlights of that. So um, anything you want to add? 50 pages. I know it's our yeah it's gonna be one. It's gonna be a little longer than that I think. Yeah. It's gonna be what? A little longer than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So the frequently asked questions, are you looking for those questions at this point or you're looking for those questions once we sort of see a draft of the report? Um, I, I, guess, I guess I would welcome them at this stage. I mean, we could come up with them, mm -hmm. but I'd be more interested, you know, from your point of view, what questions you hear. Um, there's no reason that once you read the draft, you know, in a, a couple months that you couldn't submit them then, but... Um, I guess the sooner the better. We'll have more time to think about good responses to that. Okay. Sharon? Um, are we looking for feedback or questions on this today? Sure. Okay. So, because I have a few. Um, one of them, just starting off um, with the discussion, what is free trade? One of the things that's been of interest to me looking at this issue mm -hmm. over the last couple of years is the way what is free trade versus what is a free trade agreement? And I wonder if you're going to get into that a little bit because, you know, NAFTA, and you are focusing on NAFTA as kind of a, a touchstone or a template or, a, you know, a comparison point. One of the big differences with NAFTA is it has this whole focus on regulatory coherence, which is sort of trying to merge policies, domestic policies, to a degree that had never been um, attempted in previous large trade agreements, um, at least investment agreements. and. Um, of course, secondly, the ISDS provisions, which you do mention later on. Um, because I, I just think, you know, just trying to think about this, there's lots of people like myself that are very interested in seeing trade happen mm -hmm. and not opposed to trade, but have concerns about how trade agreements have been structured and what um, they're designed to do. Uh, and so that's just sort of a question of when you say what is free trade, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that myself. I mean, I see. I, you know, I'm interested in how you're looking at that. For that section, it's definitely the, kind of the economic definition of free trade, um, uh -huh. not the, um, I guess not the larger issue of how free trade agreements are negotiated no not how they're negotiated but what's in them so for example a, a, a trade agreement that has rules in it about how um, let's say GMOs are treated in in um, agriculture or things like that it's not just about tariffs anymore so mm -hmm. that's it's not just about getting rid of tariffs I mean the vast majority of the TPP as well as NAFTA are about other things as well, and they have implications for trade. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just wondering if you're getting. Yeah. Oh, yes. I I wasn't envisioning addressing it there, but definitely when we talk about the TPP itself and explaining those major components, I think it's critical to port to point out that it's not really just about tariffs and quotas anymore. That what <clears throat> these this trade agreement is addressing is more kind of the regulations and rules of trade. Right, and that that so. can also have an impact economic. I just finished writing a 50-page paper, paper on the meat 
industry and how it may be affected by TTIP, mm -hmm. not TPP, but it's very clear from that that there's things that are pushing it in a certain direction that affect trade from one country or another. And, yep. you know, it's sort of informing my questioning on this. Um, yes. No, I think it's a, a good point to make the difference between free trade and free trade agreements. Um, we do want to make the point of what is free trade to begin with. <laughs> to we, we, feels we very academic. <laughs> we did discuss this, and we decided yeah, to yeah. talk about it in, in the third section yeah. rather than up front just because this thing is kind of growing exponentially. No, I, I understand. That's why that paper ended up <laughs> over 50 pages so, just for the like industry. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. My first frequently asked question uh, for her is what's the difference between a free trade agreement and free trade? Okay. That's, the, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was going to say. And then I had a couple more questions, but I don't know if, if other people want to ask on this section or, um, you know, I don't want to. Okay. So, so another question I had um, is when you're looking at the um, assessments of what the impact of the agreement are on, say, the economy, um, are you going to be going through the critiques of some of the, like the International Trade Commissions, et cetera? Because some of the material I've read say things like, for example, there's assumptions in that ITC report that everyone who loses a job will basically immediately get a job that is of the same or better pay. And I can just give you some firsthand experience. I used to be a state legislator. I represented a district that had seven or eight different mills, textile mill, paper mill, and footwear factories that all went out of business during, you know, the eight, mm -hmm. ten years um, I was in the Senate. And I was very involved in the peer support program, and those people did not get jobs right away, and they certainly didn't get jobs, most of them, that had anything close to the kinds of benefits and um, pay uh, that they had had before. And so I just, you know, wondered if you're going to be, because there's a lot of material on that, that the, the assumptions in some of these um, uh, analyses seem to be somewhat off base. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's say in, in a word, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> speak more to okay, that? good. <laughs> we are going to explore that. I mean, we are aware that there are there's criticism about some of the assessments. Uh, from an academic point of view, anytime you construct an estimate, you're using assumptions. It's inevitable. You must assume something or you can't get anything. Right, but are they reasonable assumptions? Well, that, that actually that's not the pertinent question. The, the, the pertinent question is, does it make a difference to the estimates? So sometimes you can make assumptions you know are unreasonable, but if they don't make any difference to, or a minimal difference, that's the question. So. What we're going to be exploring in these critiques is if you relax these assumptions about how workers transition from one career to another, which we know there's a lot of evidence that doesn't happen seamlessly, even though that assumption might be built into the model, the pertinent question, at least from an academic point of view, is how much difference does that assumption make to the estimates? And that's what we're going to be focusing on. Okay, well, I, I would um, urge you to look not only at my anecdotal experience, but at the literature on that. And I would just suggest also that one place to look is how reliable the International Trade Commission assessments have been in the past, uh, if you are looking at that. And there is some, uh, there's material that have done, have looked at that and found them to be somewhat off base. So if you're trying to figure out does it make a difference, uh, looking at the reliability of previous assessments might be one place where you could start to figure that out. Uh, and the other is that just what, you know, what are the jobs that we're getting uh, in as a replacement and what have those jobs been in the state of Maine. And again, if you're looking as, at NAFTA as a comparison, um, you know, issues about, and I don't know if you're looking regionally at all, but certainly the job market in Portland and people doing, if they are doing high tech jobs or whatever they're doing in Portland, may not be the kinds of jobs that you see available in central Maine mm -hmm. that I, where I live or used to represent and certainly other parts of, you know, western and northern Maine as well, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. 
In section two, you say the decline of manufacturing, and there have been more declines in manufacturing, and you touch on some of them in section four, but I would assume relating to NAFTA, you're going to pursue uh, the declines in agriculture, forestry, fish, fishing, fish processing, and such things. In other words, what's the effect of NAFTA have on some of the um, principal areas in the state of Maine? And in, in Section 4, you talk about the TPP's estimated impact on Maine. And uh, you say on select industries, uh, agriculture, fishing, footwear, and uh, prescription drugs. And I guess I would want to see you address uh, also the same things I mentioned above, um, forestry um, and all manufacturing. And, and I was wondering why there's a discrepancy between Section 2 and Section 4, why the difference between the post-NAFTA and the TPP's estimated impact. Um, well, Section 2 is looking at the economy post-NAFTA. I should just clarify. Well, I, it's no, not looking in, at... In number 3, you, I'm sorry, number 4, you talk about what you're going to talk about, the decline of manufacturing, and I, I would hope you would expand that to some of the areas you mentioned in number two under section four, and what I'm talking about is what you mentioned in number four is agriculture, fishing, footwear, and I would suggest uh, forestry, forestry, and such things which were uh, significant in Maine, and um, the same way as uh, Miss Treat, I have some experience with what's happened uh, in the decline in Maine. Uh, industry over the last 30 years and uh, most of that was impacted by uh, foreign trade which disadvantaged Maine and uh, so I'm, I'm wondering why we're not going to address in section 2 which is post NAFTA the same types of things we're going to address in section 4 which is uh, Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership estimated impact on Maine. One's already happened, one's going to happen and uh, I guess I would like to make sure that you um, consider the, the other significant areas in Maine other than uh, manufacturing and trans in, the, in the NAFTA, post-NAFTA, in the same way down in Section 4. That's my only comment. And sure. I think it's with, consistent with what Ms. Street said. Well, just to clarify, Section 2 is not an evaluation of NAFTA's impact on the Maine economy. Section two is where is Maine's at? Where where is Maine at now? Uh, Twenty years after NAFTA, we're not going to try to evaluate what was because of NAFTA and what wasn't. The legislature did commission a, a report like that. Um, I think it was ten years after NAFTA, which is valuable. It's done by Planning Decisions. I think in two thousand three. So you can can look at that if you're interested in that analysis. What we're looking at, and it certainly includes the natural resource industries, is what has been happening to Maine. Um, where have the jobs been lost and where have they been gained? Um, because the impact of a new trade agreement is going to be different on Maine based on how it is. The impact of the TPP will be different on Maine today than it would have been 20 years ago, say, because we have already lost tens of thousands of jobs in manufacturing. We need to look at what is going to happen now. Um, will we lose m tens of thousands more, of more jobs, or have those trade-sensitive jobs already been lost? So we want to um, sort out and get, make sure everyone kind of just get a clear picture of where are we today. The biggest dec decline number-wise by far has been in manufacturing. That's why we highlight it. Um, but certainly those other natural resource-based industries have lost. Um, you know, thousands of jobs. Well, we could do a, a little bit of the stuff that we were planning on putting in Section 4. We could give a predecessor in, in Section 2 and do a look back a bit further in some of these specific industries so we're dealing with these two sections consistently. Sure. Representative Saucier. Oh, wrong one. Sorry. 
Um, I was wondering if you could uh, expand on um, how free trade agreements affect fair trade. We hear it all the time that no matter what agreement we, we will, you know, pursue with other countries, it always seems like the United States always gets a short end of the stick. You know, uh, we can we import a lot more than we export. And uh, I can remember when NAFTA first came into being how, because I live on a border, in a border community with Canada, how, you know, Canadians could come over and buy things in the U.S. and we could do the same over there, but we could buy, say, $200 a day bringing it back without any any tariff or any, any duty, and but the Canadians were only allowed to buy fifty dollars and bring it back, and so mm -hmm. you can see with just that disparity on one item how we would be you know the Canadians would not be bringing back more into their country, so we would not be exporting basically on a consumer level uh, a very a small quantity compared to what they could do, and. Uh, and, and I, I don't see any. I don't see any topic here where we talk about how any trade agreement is actually fair trade for the United States. And I was wondering if maybe you guys could expand on that. I don't know whether that's in our assessment. I think fair is for you guys to decide. To be honest, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how to. Uh, uh, well, I guess the reason that why one. I bring that up is because it it, it it not only appears but statistics prove that. The NAFTA agreements have not been good for the United States. They've been good for Canada and Mexico, but not so good for us. And I'm just wondering, agreement, mm -hmm. how are we going to get the short end of the stick again? I guess that's that's my, yeah. my 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 question. Well, I think the only way we can can judge that at this point of view, without you know, with the information we have now, is to look at these um, national estimates, look at the assumptions that underlie them, um, and see how they might play out for Maine. Um, I don't know if we, uh, to be honest, I, I, we can't, um, you know, we're trying to be neutral here. So um, we're, uh, I don't think fair, the word fair has ever come up in any of our discussions about this report. It's kind of more, what do we know? You know, and then uh, that's for I, I, other I people to decide. I would be extremely uncomfortable writing any report where I claim to know what fair trade is. What is fair? I don't know. I, I'm, I don't want to go there. Yeah. I, I, I just, we could, we could talk about uh, different trade policies. They're, they could be different across countries, and you might infer that's unfair, but as a researcher, I, to, that's an opinion. Fairness is an opinion. I can't really say what's fair and what's not fair. Sharon? Um, another question I have in just trying to get at the what the Im impacts might be. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I would just suggest it, it, we're in a different place from NAFTA because perhaps all the jobs are already gone. That's what you said. They may already be job the tra gone, the trade impacted jobs. But also, the TPP, unlike NAFTA, is an agreement with 12 different countries. Um, some are high-income countries like the U.S., Australia, New Zealand. Others are very low-income countries, more like Mexico, uh, or even lower income than Mexico mm -hmm. in terms of Malaysia, Vietnam, and those kinds of things. So I, I, I'm assuming that in sort of evaluating the impact, and one place where I, I think it, you know, it comes to light in, in just you know, my, my thing about it may, may well be in the seafood area. For example, we already import in the U.S. vastly more than we export. Uh, and some of the uh, uh, um, reporting I've seen, it seems to indicate that we're, in fact, going to, con that's going to grow, that importation. And a lot of it is from these Asian um, countries. Um, so that just might be, you know, I, I personally would be very interested in, in seeing what you can suss out about that, because when the U.S. Chamber with the um, Commerce Department came out with a, they called it a fact sheet, but I don't think it had many facts in it, because it basically said, like, seafood's going to grow exponentially because it's been growing, so it's going to continue to grow. That's kind of the scope of their analysis. And it didn't look at things like, you know, closed um, 
you know, sh shellfish seasons because of lack of sustainability because we have a very sustainable to the extent we can. We're trying hard to be sustainable in Maine and not just overfish everything. So those kinds of, you know, differences, uh, you know, it'd be great if someone, I know it's I'm not being paid a lot to do this report, <laughs> but it would be great for someone to get into that a level of detail that isn't just this sort of superficial level that the you know, Department of Commerce came out with that I, I just found it to be really not very reliable. Yeah. So that's just a suggestion. And then just getting to this issue of fairness, maybe a measure of fairness, and we won't call it that, but a measure of what this trade agreement might do or might not do could be looking at income inequality in the state and whether it promotes you know, in mm. general, not just an average of some people doing well and other people doing really badly, but that it promotes essentially improvement for mu many more people than, yeah. than it doesn't. And, and income inequality is a way of kind of getting at that a little bit. And, uh, and, and that's something I think that um, really could add to this if, if you took a look at that. Mm -hmm. That, that certainly is a is a point that comes up frequently, especially in the introduction, because that's that's really the the crux of the matter is that when there is there are changes in trade, some people benefit, some people lose. It's the distributional consequences are huge, and we haven't planned on a section on that per se, although yeah. we we have <laughs> written some parts about that. Yeah. Um, this is all great stuff. We're going to have to figure out how to keep the scope of this manageable. To be honest, we've already written 30 pages of just background. <laughs> and you can go anywhere with on this. And certainly some of it does, uh, we did look at, you know, what are the, the trade and, uh, sorry, the, the changes in um, trade with Canada and Mexico and also with Asia, you know, specifically China. And we look at um, since NAFTA, uh, became law in 1994, what has been happening with trade and with Canada and Mexico, and then what's been happening with China. And it's just, um, we have no trade agreement with China, but trade with, but you know, imports um, have just, uh, they're, they've increased, I don't know, fivefold, sixfold, I mean, it's, it, it's astronomical. So, not astronomical, but it, you know, it's, it's very high. And so, um, one thing hopefully we can try to sort out is, um, a lot does get blamed on free trade agreements like NAFTA, but some of it is just trade. You know, we don't have an, a trade agreement with China outside, you know, the WTO, but yet we are importing a tremendous amount from them, and that's that's probably the biggest thing that's changed in the last 20 years. So, how do you sort out what was NAFTA and what's just trade with a country like China? Um, so, your point about it being with different types of countries, low income, um, high income, developing, developed. Um, specifically the Asian countries, um, I think is very pertinent, you know, so it's certainly part of this analysis. Because it has implications also in the, um, the number of countries. So for example, when you do your ISDS analysis, one of the aspects of the TPP is just that some of it is what are the rules that are in the ISDS, mm -hmm. but some of it is how many more companies and where are they can now take advantage of this that couldn't before because they weren't covered by previous uh, investment agreements. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is a different animal than, than NAFTA in, in a number of ways. Maybe some of those ways are beneficial, maybe some aren't, you know, but that's another way that um, it's going to have a disproportionately different kind of impact um, mm -hmm. on the U.S. Mm -hmm. Senator? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Phil, to your point about potentially there's always going to be winners and losers, and that's kind of one of the things that has always worried me and irked me is the fact of quantifiably we look at Maine as having winners and losers more down south versus urban versus rural, and that way throughout the whole country and as well as some of the countries that we have trade with where you have your little small farmers are now in foreign nations are now extinct because now they're big farms and stuff like that so I'm always trying to 
find ways to, to better quantify what are the real winners and losers in any trade agreement and the effects of the trade agreements, especially NAFTA and stuff. And do we actually have a handle? Yeah, we, we know we might have lost 50,000 manufacturing jobs, but what was that? what's the real impact? The real impact with that in, in the standpoint of the economy, like in Maine or America and some of the other foreign countries. So, I and I do know that there will be winners and losers uh, in knowing, as John, Mr. Palmer said, uh, I also live in Oxford County, and in my lifetime, uh, 54, it's at least 54 factories have shut down. Uh, and, and the strength of a, a, a national economy like China is now booming because they make things. They're a manufacturing juggernaut, and America is going just the opposite. If we're not making things and we're a service society, how do we quantify the benefit to uh, an international trade agreement on our society or any society if there's not a balance, a, a gain for us? So uh, I'm just I'm curious to see what you'll come up with when when you make that assessment on if there's going to be any assessment on winners and losers, potentially winners and losers or whatever. And that's just a comment about whether or not you're able to factor that into the report or not. Dr. Case? Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Dr. Case. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a question that sort of um, follows the Senator's question. Um, actually, I have two questions. So one is um, whether there will be some inclusion about other uh, sectors of the economy in Maine uh, besides the manufacturing sector. So part of this may be the chicken and egg uh, question, uh, but clearly we've had a rise in the service industry in the state. And what kind of an impact uh, does an agreement like this have on the continuing trend of that rise in the service sector. One of the challenges has been that while we have many more service jobs available, uh, all too often they have been low-paying service jobs. And uh, to uh, Ms. Treat's uh, comment earlier that when we lose those manufacturing jobs, uh, we don't necessarily uh, have people finding jobs of, a, of an equal or greater income level in the service industry, and typically they, they have been in the service industry. Um, so that's one piece uh, that I, I think we, we would make sense to include as well as the manufacturing piece. Um, secondarily, tied to that um, is the question, uh, so Section 4 is the TTP's estimated impact on Maine. So I guess I would also be interested in uh, what would be the uh, impact on Maine without the TTP, um, because I think that's the important comparison to, to look at if you want to look at apples to apples. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that both sides of that coin are making assumptions, um, but that's the only way we can uh, move forward and, and have a, a cogent conversation. But I, I think mm -hmm. it would make sense to include that piece as well. Actually, you, you raised a point that I meant to bring up earlier, is that when we do discuss, uh, or at least make some rough in inferences about how NAFTA has affected Maine, it, it's the estimates are so imprecise. We don't know because there's so many things change at the same time. So the trend from manufacturing towards services, that's, that's happening without NAFTA. And the same is true for TPP. So disentangling those, thing, those two things is, is very, very difficult. And so I, I want to take the opportunity to stress that we're not going to, going to be able to give you hard estimates that you would like. Uh, you probably know that, but I just want to stress that. Um, but I certainly can point out that the Department of Labor is already projecting the state to lose thousands of more manufacturing jobs without the TPP. So we can point out point to things like that. But we will do our best to see what the the previous research is predicting for how various uh, sectors will be affected differentially, that is, try to disentangle what's going to happen anyway and what's going to happen as a result of the TPP. Randy, you're looking like you had something to say. 
Okay. Good. Any, any last comment, Dr. Case? Uh, sorry, it, it just occurred to me uh, kind of one other piece of this, just thinking about as we've made this transition, and I hear what you're saying, um, we, we, we tend to, for those people who are not in support of NAFTA, uh, during, before, after, uh, it's easy to blame all that's wrong with the economy on NAFTA. But the reality is much of this may have happened the way it did anyway. Maybe it was only a small component. Um, and that is hard to tease out. But part of what I wonder about our manufacturing jobs that exist and the things that we are exporting, thinking about our initial conversation today, um, anywhere I've traveled in the world, uh, when I've gone to uh, a fine restaurant, whether it be in Europe, uh, North America, um, what's on the menu? Maine lobster. So I think there's an example here of something that we export that is uh, a high-end product. Um, I think about uh, footwear. Um, you know, look at where we have gone with footwear in terms of uh, the quality uh, of what New Balance represents. Um, and there are certainly uh, several other uh, examples. Uh, we were just talking about the Zumwalt. Uh, clearly, um, you know, probably the, the best um, Navy ship made anywhere on the planet um, comes from Maine. So is it possible that some of what we have seen regardless of the cause, but some of this transition has led us to a place where we have the ability to export some really high quality products. And I wonder, is there an opportunity for us to look to the future with the question of how do we also create uh, the same caliber service industry uh, in Maine uh, that would uh, be right up there with the uh, manufacturing side uh, of all the things that we export. Thank you. So we can see they do not have an easy task. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> um, and I assume that if people have further thoughts, there's ways that we can reach you through LOC or um, yes, yeah, anytime. And specific, as, as we didn't really get to frequently ask questions, so I think we can actually figure some out from, from your mm -hmm. thoughts. But if you have further thoughts or sure. someone goes up to you, comes up to you and asks a question that you wish you had a really concise, good answer to, right. we'll try. Right. <laughs> well, let us know. And I think, you know, one of the things that's very confusing is the difference between the, the, the TPP and the TAP or... TPA, you know, um, that's one that I think is a fairly obvious one. Mm -hmm. um, so did you have one well, last just, thing? I'm just looking at the clock. It's yeah, after it's 2 o'clock. Just a question on um, the timing, because I'm assuming like when we've done this before, we're going to have a draft to look at and then sort of like a public hearing and the opportunity to, okay. Yep. And if, and I was thinking if, if you do have a bunch of, um, Sometimes it's easier to edit than it is to create, I have to say. So if, if you come up with a list of uh, frequently asked questions that you're thinking of, if Locke were to s email that around, it might stimulate our thinking and we could shoot back at you, you okay. know, s other suggestions yeah. or um, phrasing of those that, That's a good you know, idea. come to mind. Okay. So. Could I, um, could I add just a few? comments to the timing of this. <clears throat> the, Why don't you? Uh, I don't, I think you should probably be on mic. Thanks, sure. Locke. The, uh, the signed contract that we have with the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center specifies um, an early date in September, I don't remember it off the top of my head, by which a draft has to be submitted to the commission for your review and comment. So you, you do have sort of one last big chance to review the draft, and then I believe there's a two-week interval between when the draft is due and when the final report is done. Okay, so that's sort of the timetable. From my point of view as a staff, the timing of this assessment, at least from my point of view, is intended to be timely um, in terms of helping the CTPC 
to decide whether you want to take a stand, either pro or con, on the TPP, which is likely to be voted on. As far as I can the tell, likely. yeah, it, <laughs> the best likelihood is a, a post-election lame duck session, though there's still some question about that. But the timing of this, again, is designed for you to have the opportunity to reach a conclusion whether this commission supports the TPP or not. You have not taken a stand on that. So at least from my point of view, that's what the timing is all about. The other thing that I want to mention sort of in relation to what you just discussed is that if any of you have a frequently asked question that wasn't voiced here, to write it down and send it to me and I'll send it to them. Or a more extensive inquiry or point of view that I would encourage you to write it down instead of relying on me um, to translate it or whatever. Um, I think the most valuable questions and issues come from commission members themselves, is what I'm trying to say. And I would really encourage you to submit stuff in writing to me as soon as possible that I can then send on to Phil and Kate. Is that, is that clear? Does that, is that at variance with anything that you were expecting? Okay. Okay. Last statement? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Dr. Case. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Safe travels. So next on our agenda,